I'm Melba Foster, and this is my photo journal story of the educational field trip we took through Arkansas as part of our course requirements for EDLD 625 and 632. This story will depict my viewpoint of the activities that were relevant to my learning, as well as key moments that afforded me the opportunity to make the connections between my professional training and education to what my students may experience in everyday life. Thus, the theme for my photo journal story is Connecting the Dots. Picture number one is from the Memorial Cemetery um, in Roar, Arkansas. I captioned this picture and so it begins because this stop was the beginning of our cohort journey as well as the beginning of new learning for me. I learned new information about the Roar internment camp. This camp was one of two World War II era incarceration camps built in the state of Arkansas to house Japanese Americans from the West Coast. The Roar Relocation Camp Cemetery, the only part of the camp that remains, is now a National Historic Landmark. The information I learned and the emotions I experienced as well as we walked through the museum and cemetery can only be described as shame and sadness. Shame because I did not know about any of the internment camps. Shame because of what our government did to a group of people who did nothing wrong. For the second picture, I felt sadness because I tried to place myself in their situation. I tried to imagine what I would have felt not only for myself, but for my spouse and my children. I felt sadness for the elderly who had lost everything and for the infants who died in the camp. We must never forget the plight this group of people endured. We should learn from the past so that we don't repeat our mistakes. We as a nation must strive to continually improve the way our policies treat groups of people different from the status quo. Given the co current situation of our ambition situation, I'm not so sure that we have. The third picture is the one of the Little Rock Nine bronze sculpture. The following are excerpts from the history.com online page. The Little Rock Nine were a group of nine black students who enrolled at formerly all-white Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in September 1957. Their attendance at the school was a test of Brown versus Board of Education, a landmark 1954 Supreme Court ruling that declared segregation in public schools unconstitutional. On September 4, 1957, the first day of classes at Central High, Governor Oral Faubus called in the Na Arkansas National Guard to block the black students' entry to the high school. Later that month, President Dwight Eisenhower sent in federal troops to escort the Little Rock Nine into the school. Despite the violent opposition, nine students registered to be the first African Americans to attend Central High School. Minnie Jean Brown, Elizabeth Eckford, Ernest Green, Thelma Mothershed, Melba Patillo, Gloria Ray, Terrence Roberts, Jefferson Thomas, and Carlotta Walls had been recruited by Daisy Gaston Bates, president of the Arkansas NAACP and co-publisher of the Arkansas State Press, an influential African-American newspaper. Daisy Bates and others from Arkansas NAACP carefully vetted the group of students and determined they all possessed the strength and determination to face the resistance they would encounter. In the weeks prior to the start of the new school year, the students participated in intensive counseling sessions guiding them on to what to expect once classes began and how to respond to anticipated hostile situations. The bronze sculptures are captioned Testament, the Civil Rights Memorial, facing law and social custom that define them as second tier citizens, the Little Rock Nine, taking their cue from the ever expanding struggle for civil rights, opted to define themselves quite differently. With the help of stalwart parents, other family members and those in the community who shared their vision, this group of young people came to understand the reality of their time, but chose to believe in a reality yet to come. It was in part this focus that allowed them to suffer the indignities heaped upon them by those who firmly believed in the laws of equality. With the support of countless others around the globe, and especially the guidance of Elsie and Daisy Bates, the Little Rock Nine walked through the doors of Central High School. Their act of courage opened doors symbolically, 
all over segregated America. Okay, I have to admit, I knew something about this desegregation situation in Arkansas or Alabama. I was not sure my entire life. I knew it was somewhere in the South. I'm ashamed to admit. I never really paid attention to this situation as a young child because it did not affect me directly since it happened before I was born. However, as a somewhat educated adult, I can depict the major issues underpinning this emotional stance. On the one hand, my emotions are those of low spirits, grief, dejection, and despair. Yet on the other, there are feelings of joy, love, and tender feelings. In order for continuous improvement to be aligned with this picture, we will have to look at various scenarios. Improvement was in motion the morning that the Little Rock Nine arrived at Central High School in September of 1957. However, the continuous portion of this duo team was lagging behind. Continuous improvement must go hand in hand for it to be successful and to stand the test of time. At the time of Little Rock Nine, they continuously attended school, albeit in a less than acceptable manner at times. However, improvement was lagging far behind, particularly when the rest of the student body continued to make rude comments or statements and racial slurs toward them as well. The behavior of several students on campus did not improve toward the Little Rock Nine, yet they continued to attend. This is when my feelings of joy, love, and tenderness came around. The fourth picture is tagged Real Talk. This picture depicts our cohort and professors as we process the information we had learned. To me, this was a pivotal time in the journey because it afforded us the opportunity to conduct real talks with one another. We are a trusting group to the point that we can discuss our own points of view, listen to theirs, discuss ours again, listen to theirs again. But in the end, we learned from one another and didn't stay mad nor hold on to grudges. This type of learning and discussions go down to a deep personal level that rarely sees the light of day in our professional realm. It comes out at home or with like-thinking individuals, but rarely with those who hold a different perspective. Real talk takes place not only on this journey, but within the classroom at TAMUT, within our writing submissions, and even throughout our discussion board and blackboard. The only way we can truly say that we are in a state of continuous improvement is by conducting these difficult conversations. I can proudly say that our cohort does. We then continue with robust and flavorful discussions that can encompass anyone in the group. It has at these gatherings that I feel confident, secure, and respected. Confident to speak my mind in a professional manner, secure enough to share personal stories as they apply in context without fear of ridicule or being ignored. I feel respected within my cohort because we all bring a variance of gems to the table that others would like to learn from. I am finally at a point in my life where I can actually speak from experience and people would not mind listening. The fifth picture is tagged making the connection. Picture five encompasses a very deep and sorrowful situation. This was taken at the Heifer Ranch Global Village. It consists of a variety of cultural sites which are representative of Guatemala, Thailand, Zambia, China, Appalachia, and urban slums and a refugee camp. This picture was taken at the urban slums where we were to build a fire so that we could cook our rice as our main meal for the evening. As you can see from the picture, there was no fire. Hence, we could not cook our rice. We were hungry, tired, and I was angry. As I sat there contemplating this grim situation, I began to think back to my students. I could never really understand why some came into my office at the behest of their teacher because of their negative attitude and bad behavior. Life was good at school. They had a nice classroom, a great teacher, breakfast and lunch were provided, yet they came to school each day ready to fight the world. It became clear to me that they were not necessarily angry at us, but the school system or the school system. They were angry at what they could not control. Did they live in a situation where there was no food for them to eat, no electricity, no running water? Did they have absent parents and left to fend for themselves? Were they surrounded by strangers who traipsed in and out of their living space? I get it now. I get why they acted and felt the way they did because I experienced but a glimpse of what they live each and every day. I understand their frustration, anger, and lack of control. 
As for continuous improvement, how can we improve the quality of life for these students? Well, we must begin with developing those relationships with their families. We develop the relationships so that we can guide and assist them. Only then will we be able to make a difference in a child's life. It takes a village to raise a child. It took the surrounding villages to help feed us at the Global Village. Conclusion It is my hope that I have expressed what I experienced with our cohort field trip with my photos. It is through leadership that we can provide continuous improvement to our students. This group of leaders in this photo are taking the important steps necessary to provide a better education to our students who are our future. Continuous improvement begins with us and we must carry the torch and pass it along to the next generation of leaders who can continue to show improvement in our school system.